Antonio Huneas is an editor and staff writer for Open Minds Magazine. He's been a UFO journalist for more than 30 years and has formed countless relationships in the field. We'll talk with Antonio about one of his friends, the late Jim Mosley. Jason and I will also discuss several news stories about Mars, a strange sprouting potato UFO, and other space and UFO news right now on Spacing Out. everyone and welcome to Spacing Out. I'm Jason McClellan. And I'm Marine Ellsbury. Thanks for joining us. We'll be talking with our colleague, the veteran UFO journalist Antonio Huneas, later in the show today. But first, let's talk about what's in the news. On Tuesday, November 20th, Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity Chief Scientist John Grotzinger told NPR that an upcoming announcement about data from a recently collected soil sample by Curiosity's Sample Analysis at Mars Instrument will be earth-shaking and one for the history books. But as the Cleveland leader explains, NASA is now backpedaling on the story. Following the one for the history books comment, many began speculating that the SAM instrument had found evidence suggesting past or present life on Mars. But Guy Webster, a NASA spokesperson, downplayed the discovery, stating, it won't be earth-shaking, but it will be interesting. The Cleveland leader speculates that this could be a case of NASA not wanting to jump the gun and overhype a discovery that will disappoint people in the end. But in recent years, NASA has shown that it loves to overhype discoveries. The discovery, big or small, will be announced at the fall meeting of the American Geophysical Union, taking place December 3rd through the 7th in San Francisco, California. NASA is planning future sample return missions that would bring rock and soil samples from the Martian surface back to Earth for study. But some scientists say the best samples to bring back from Mars would be those collected from underground caverns. According to the Cleveland Leader, many researchers believe the Martian surface is unlikely to host life as we know it today. But organisms could possibly be able to survive in a lava tube or other underground environments. Lava tubes and other subterranean caverns are common on Mars, but exploring the Martian surface is a difficult task in itself. Exploring below the planet's surface would be even more difficult. Astrobiologist and cave scientist Penny Boston from the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology says, while I'm very much interested in surface sample return to get us over this hump of doing it, of course, I immediately want to go on and start sampling more cryptic material in lava tube caves. I would love that. In addition to providing clues about past and or present life below the Martian surface, a robotic mission to explore the Martian underground could provide valuable information that could benefit future manned mi Mars missions. Because lava tubes are likely to be the most promising places to establish human colonies on Mars. Although scientists aren't quite ready to send robots into Martian caves, such a mission could be launched in the near future. According to Penny Boston, an underground exploring robot could be ready to launch to Mars by the early 2030s. Speaking of establishing human colonies on Mars, we've talked about SpaceX founder Elon Musk and his desire to colonize Mars on this show many times before. Well, speaking at the Royal Aeronautical Society in London on Friday, November 16th, Musk shared more details about his plans to make Mars colonies a reality. Space.com explains that Musk wants to help establish a Mars colony of up to 80,000 people by taking colonists to the Red Planet at a cost of $500,000 per person. Musk's Mars settlement program would start with a pioneering group of fewer than 10 people. These initial colonists would ferry to Mars on a huge reusable rocket powered by liquid oxygen and methane. According to Space.com, accompanying the founders of the new Mars colony would be large amounts of equipment, including machines to produce fertilizer, methane and oxygen from Mars' atmospheric nitrogen and carbon dioxide, and the planet's subsurface water ice. The Mars pioneers would also take with them construction materials to build transparent domes that would be pressurized with Mars atmospheric CO2, enabling Earth crops to grow in Martian soil. The huge reusable rocket would start transporting more people to Mars after the colony becomes self-sufficient. So when is all this going to take place? Well, transportation is the first hurdle. But Musk hopes to have a fully reusable version of the SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket ready in five to six years. Musk envisions the Mars colonization program as a collaboration between government and private enterprise and projects the cost at approximately $36 billion. A couple of weeks ago, we told you about an anonymous man who gave KDVR Fox 31 in Denver, Colorado, a video showing what he claims are UFOs over the city. He claimed these objects appear a couple times a week, but the objects fly too fast to see with the naked eye. A photojournalist from the station went to the same location as the anonymous man, set up his camera, and managed to capture footage of a UFO for himself. You probably remember that the station then showed this video to an aviation expert, Steve Cowell, who responded, That is not an airplane. That is not a helicopter. Those are not birds. I can't identify it. 
He also concluded that the objects are not insects. And as we pointed out on the show, an aviation expert hardly seemed like the most qualified person to identify what could or could not have been an insect. Apparently, KDVR Fox 31 agreed. They asked an entomologist to analyze the video. This entomologist watched the video and commented, This is a toughie. I've never seen anything like this. According to KDVR Fox 31, she concluded, I do not believe it's an insect. The shape is inconsistent with an insect. So, the mystery in Denver continues. On Wednesday, November 21st, the website io9.com posted a story about one of the more unusual UFO sightings of the year. As the site described, this utterly bizarre UFO was captured on video over Milwaukee, Oregon on September 6, 2012. The sighting was reported to the Oregon section of the Mutual UFO Network. The Oregon MUFON case study explains that witness Don Anzerberg recorded video of a small, transforming, odd, colorful, compact UFO from his backyard in blue sky daylight. The constantly transforming, compact UFO showed oddly growing and transforming protuberances with occasional flaring up bright spots. He first saw the UFO and then began video recording it as it moved along slowly in the sky. These growing and transforming protuberances inspired the witness to name the object the Sprouting Potato UFO. The 2 minute and 34 second video recorded by the witness was captured using a Nikon Coolpix P510 camera. Although the odd looking object resembles and behaves like an animal or character shaped balloon, Oregon MUFON has concluded that the object is likely an extraterrestrial UFO that mimics a balloon. Now, I'm not sure how I feel about this conclusion by MUFON, or Oregon MUFON. Um, I haven't heard much about these, these mimic UFOs, balloon mimic UFOs. I, I, I don't know. I guess they have record and case files where there are similar instances where there are these balloons or things that look like balloons, but they've concluded that there's a type of UFO out there that mimics balloons. I've heard a few cases revolving around that idea. It's just hard for me to swallow, honestly. I think that, to me, it just looks so much like a giant animal balloon. Yeah, like I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm open to the idea that there are you know, some UFOs that could resemble balloons. But in this case, you have an object that just kind of wildly floating through the sky, spinning with no particular axis of rotation. It's just tumbling like a balloon would. Um, seems kind of strange for an extraterrestrial spacecraft to kind of be tumbling through the sky and with no purpose. An odd camouflage uh, situation, I guess. Yeah, and again, you have the idea of the fact that it's like undulating in certain spots and transforming colors, which I think could be easily explained by the fact that the air is probably moving inside the balloon or it's losing air, and you're getting those different colors hitting the sunlight. I mean, it was in the bright blue sky. Right, the, f the flaring up, that's what I thought of. I mean, when you see a balloon in the sky, especially one with different colors and the, the sun's gonna catch it mm -hmm. in different ways when it rotates, that could explain the, the flaring up. Again, I wasn't there, I didn't see it, so I'm not sure right. what this flaring up is actually referring to, but that's, that's what the, the vision I get in my mind when I, when I hear it written down. Another thing about this is the theory of a, a balloon for possible identification seemed to be dismissed pretty quickly, mm -hmm. saying, that, well, just because you know, we weren't able to find a similar looking balloon online, it's probably not a balloon. You know, there are a lot of balloons out there, uh, custom manufactured balloons. I mean, look at the balloons you see in the, the Macy's mm -hmm. Thanksgiving Day Parade. Right, and I, I think that that was why it was so easy for me to say it looks like a giant turkey is because we found out about this during Thanksgiving, even though it was shot in September right. 6th. But yeah, a lot, you're not going to find those big parade balloons online. Right. So. And how often do you see a big balloon or, 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 or animal or, or character-shaped balloon floating in the sky? Mm -hmm. Not often. So yes, it's going to seem out of the ordinary. It's going to be bizarre. And we're not familiar with what that looks like in the sky. Right. There needs to be more study here. And I think somebody should offer up a large turkey balloon for us to play with. That would be great. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk about <laughs> Mars. There's a lot of Mars news yeah. this week. Mars overload. And, you know, we have another an announcement from NASA about curiosity, discovery. And, man, NASA, I don't know what their problem. I don't know if they need a new PR person or if <laughs> they just really enjoy doing this. But they love the hype. Right. They really do. They demonstrated that over and over, especially the past couple of years. We saw it with the 
the discovery in Mono Lake in California, they put out this press release mm -hmm. saying that they had a discovery that was going to impact the search for extraterrestrial life. Got people all psyched up. Mainly you and I, and we watched the press well, yes. conference and we're heartbroken. But <laughs> yes. But yeah, I mean, we'll we'll see what happens. Um, and I think that they're backpedaling because I think they know that they overhype things. Uh, but I think that maybe that we'll find something neat, but it just won't be what we want to hear. Right. And then on to, see, I, I think NASA must listen to our show because they, <laughs> they finally listened to us about these caves on Mars, the underground of Mars. And they're finally looking at missions to the lava tubes, to underground caverns on Mars in the near future. Well, 2030 is so kind of a long time. I think no, it'll happen sooner than but that. But this is exciting because um, last year, um, the, oh, the discoveries in Oregon that happened with, they found uh, microbes that were surviving in near freezing temperatures in um, caves in Oregon. And basically they found out that life could potentially thrive without um, oxygen and uh, other Earth-like temperatures that would fit on Mars. So that potentially in these lava tubes would be a great place to look for either um, life that used to exist there or maybe current life. Right. And, you know, they're a good place for us to go, too, if we decide to go up there, uh, you know, better shielded from <laughs> elements and, and radiation and things like that. I think so, but uh, that situation, I just see, like, a giant earthworm sort of, uh, like, tremors or something coming out. <laughs> oh, they're there. They're there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I wonder what kind of life is down in those tubes. But... More from our friend Elon Musk now. That guy's serious. You know, I, I don't think some people fully understand yet just how serious he is about not only space travel and space exploration, but the colonization of Mars and other worlds. It's not just talk with him. He is moving forward. He is working on the technology and has a lot of the technology mm -hmm. already. You know, a lot of people sit around and talk about theories and the possibility of someday doing this. We're still talking about the possibility of sending humans to Mars, and he's already beyond that and talking about the colonies. Right. And this is, there's not actually a lot of new information in this. Uh, he's already announced most of us. The point is, is his plan is uh, advancing. And now he's going to say, hey, look, these reusable rockets, five to six years, we're going to have them done. So it's kind of like, Get ready, uh, first 10 colonists. And it, it, with the, uh, the NASA and exploring lava tubes, it's so funny because I think he's going to have his colony started before they have their robot ready to crawl into a I, tube on Mars. I completely agree. I, I'm curious to see how long once, you know, they get up there and set up their domes where they're able to grow uh, earth plants and self, be self-sustainable. Yeah then how long it takes for the next group of colonists to come. Right. And you're going to have the people who just want to start populating right away, and that's just fine. But I'm excited about... What else are they going to do up there? <laughs> that's right. No. No, I, I'm so excited about this, and again, we talk about this. I mean, we, we are very, very much very close to living in a true sort of Star Trek universe. I mean, that reality is coming soon. Space colonization is coming soon. Space travel is, is coming even sooner than that just accessible space travel for all of us. So very exciting time to be alive. Oh, definitely. Yes. Well, that is what is in the news this week. Thanks for joining us, Antonio. We're excited that we could finally have you on the show. My pleasure, Jason and Maureen. Well, we've definitely talked about you before on the show, and this is the first time we've actually had you on the show. And for those in our audience who aren't familiar with you, you've been researching UFOs for a very, very long time. And if you wouldn't mind, very briefly, let us know how you got started in the UFO field. Well, that was in 1977 when I got started. I was living in New York City in the village, and uh, a, a series of things happened all at once, either by destiny, synchronicity, uh, or whatever. And uh, so my brother had mailed me these clippings about a very bizarre uh, UFO incident, a close encounter in Chile involving a, a military patrol in the north of Chile. And then I happened to see a newspaper, an alternative newspaper in my local newsstand. It was called the New York Daily Planet. 
and uh, it was published by Mike Luckman, who later, you know, did that book Alien Rock. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was trying to make my inroads into the, into the New York press one way or another, and I saw, well, this is total alternative. I don't need connections for this. So I just walked into their offices in Union Square, and the secretary said, you just wait for Mike. He loves UFOs. I'm sure he'll use it. And sure enough, Luckman took a look at it, and it was published. And that was in uh, July of 1977. That got me started. Uh, initially, of course, I would have never thought that I was going to be involved, you know, for the rest of my life. I mean, when you're a journalist, you cover many different things. But somehow, that was a very good window, and there were a lot of interesting things happening. By 1978, we had the official UFO hearings at the United Nations, and, you know, uh, sponsored by the Prime Minister of Grenada. Uh, and that was really the first UFO event I ever attended. And an official hearing at the United Nations was great. And I got to meet Dr. Heineck and Jack Ballet and Stanton Friedman, you know, because I was a nobody basically back in those days. And then we had also the declassification uh, process. The Freedom of Information Act had just been amended after Watergate, and it was bearing its first fruits. You know, you had the Blue Book and you had. Uh, uh, the CIA files, the FBI documents, they were all coming out uh, for the first time. Then the French had just created the, um, their official uh, study group at the, at the space agency. All these things were happening, you know, so it seemed like a very promising period. But unfortunately, by the 80s, it all, it all petered out. But by that time, I was hooked, and I began publishing first in some of the pulp uh, UFO magazines, and that was in the 80s. Uh, I was also sending some articles to publications in South America. I began publishing in magazines in Spain as well. And then later, you know, I was involved uh, with FATE. I was a columnist with FATE, the UFO Chronicle column it was called, for about 10 years. And I worked for, with, for the Japanese as well. And uh, I was uh, one of the co-authors of the briefing document, the Rockefeller Initiative, which is now in our website and so on, you know, until finally I, I was hired full-time, <laughs> and that was thanks to Open Minds. Well, we're grateful to have you on staff. You're a walking walk encyclopedia of UFOs and all the facts, and uh, really useful. Um, lately, unfortunately, two weeks ago, um, Jim Mosley died, who was a good friend of yours and mm -hmm. most well-known to everyone for producing his typewriter newsletter, uh, Saucer Smear. But he got his start doing a different publication. Right. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, Jim Mosley, one of the legendary figures in American ufology. Uh, I don't even remember exactly when I met him, probably in that early period. I must have been around 78, 79. Uh, at Tim Beckley's, I remember, at a party in Tim Beckley's apartment in, right in, in Manhattan. And uh, we hit it off great from the start. One of the things we had in common was uh, our South America, because he loved South America. He had been involved in all these, uh, in the business of um, basically grave robbing, <laughs> you know, vaqueros, as they call them in South America. He had some antiquities business at the time. He also did some UFO stuff back in, in Peru also. And Jim had really started in 1953. He was the son of a prominent um, um, army general, but uh, he didn't get along uh, at all with his father. His father was a notorious right-wing figure in the Roosevelt era. So he became kind of a rebel. I think he, he attended Princeton, then he quit. He went into real estate, antiquities, and of course ufology. In 53, he started doing a trip around the United States. And he teamed up with this uh, publicist and uh, journalist called Gray Barker. They became very good friends. Barker was uh, a total promoter of UFOs, although unscrupulous. He did a couple of famous hoaxes and stuff. Mostly was much more critical, but they had great chemistry. And so at that time, they published this, this uh, publication called UFO News in the late 50s and uh, I suppose up to the early 60s. And that was not at all like social smear. That was an actual, even though it was mimeograph, was not a commercial publication, you know, a slick publication like ours. But nevertheless, it was important because it was critical. Uh, it was not a debunker thing either, but uh, I mean, mostly always did believe that UFOs were real though. People sometimes confuse. He thought that he was totally skeptic. That's because he was skeptic of a lot of the more famous cases. He, anything that was too huge, too controversial, he, he tended to disbelieve, including the Roswell crash and some of the theories of uh, hybrids and abductions and things like that. But he did believe that there was a core of truly unexplained incidents, and that's what kept him going. 
But over the years, I guess he shifted from just the investigation of UFO cases themselves to the sort of the social commentary of an ufology. And that's when Saucer Smear started, not under that name. It had different names like uh, Saucer Gossip, whatever, I don't remember right now. But in the first, probably in the early 70s, it started totally non-scheduled, uh, whenever mostly would, would get it together and put an issue. Uh, it was only like uh, to a select list. But over the years, you know, he would, ask, and being a funny guy, he, he called them the love offerings. And so then it was basically kind of a subscription. And it lasted till the very end. Uh, I, I spoke with him just like a few days before I went on this last vacation trip right, to yeah. Chile. And um, yeah, he was alert and uh, really the UFO, the saucer smear was the thing that kept him going intellectually. He had a lot of fun. He couldn't function at all on the web, but he had a, a partner called Ditchka who would basically monitor anything interesting on the, on, the, on the web about UFOs and print it, hard copy, and then mail it to Jim because he refused to even go there with computers and wow. stuff like that. Now he mostly was also involved with uh, UFO conferences, wasn't he? Correct. In the 60s, he created an outfit called the National UFO Conference. Uh, which was officially an organization, but not members, and it didn't publish a newsletter, nothing. Basically, it was a vehicle f for him to put a one conference a year. And often, he, it was like a franchise. He would team up with uh, Beckley or Pat Marcatelli or someone else who already was putting a conference, and then it would be co-sponsored. But then it would become officially the national, you know, the 14th National UFO Conference or whatever. Uh, this went on for a long time. And one of the things they used to do was to give a, an award, the Ufologist of the Year Award. And I was honored that he gave it to me in 1990 at the wow. Miami Beach. And uh, one of the funny things at that conference, which again illustrates the type of person that Mosley was, he could be friends with people in which he totally disbelieved their cases. I mean, it was up to the other person. Some people, you know, they take it too personally, and if you don't believe in my case, I cannot be your friend. But others, they don't, they don't mind so much. And one was uh, Ed Walters. Which uh, is yeah, Gulf Breeze. Yeah, yeah, the Gulf Breeze uh, famous series of incidents. And mostly had moved in the 80s to Key West. So he was in Florida. And he actually went there and met him, and they became friends. Uh, I don't think he ever really believed in the case, but somehow he did become friends. When Walters published his book, then he was invited to the National UFO Conference. And the funny thing is that some of the photos when, he's give, when Moses gave me the award were taken by Ed Walters. So they're <laughs> actual Ed Walters. I saved the envelope, you know. It's a, it's a funny anecdote. That's great. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so that, that went on until finally, I don't know, in the late, late 90s, 2000, I forgot when, he finally sold the title. Mm -hmm. And it was, I believe it was acquired, Lisa Davison, I think she's called, mm -hmm. uh, some woman from California. But I think they put one year and then it petered out mm -hmm. because uh, Jim was getting too old now and he didn't want to travel. Prior to that, though, not only he would put his own conference, he would go to every important conference in the United States at his own expense. He was, he was pretty well off. And because that's how he would collect, you know, a lot of the anecdotes and gossip. He loved martinis, and you could always find him at the bar uh, chatting with people. I wonder if he's just drinking virgin martinis so he can get everyone else loose-lipped to tell him all the, the good gossip for yeah. saucer smear. Well, he even told me one time that when he had to give lectures, you know, he also discovered that yeah, up to two martinis he could have. <laughs> two were good, but if it, one time he had three and it, it bombed, you know. And if he, he had, had it all figured yeah, out. Yeah, he had it all figured out. Because he never would show slides or anything. He would just ramble. Yeah. It was, well, I'm becoming a little bit like that. Once you've been in the field for so long, you know, you've met everybody, you've yeah. been everywhere, so you can and just jump between one name. Oh, Adamski, I knew Adam. I debunked Adamski back in the 50s. That was, by the way, one of the most famous um, uh, right. issues. They, 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 when that was at the peak of Adamski's fame, George Adamski, you know, the contactee. And uh, mostly they published an entire issue of Saucer News, basically f finding out all the inconsistencies. Wasn't that one of his, his big hoaxes, though, too, was that yeah. he and, and Gary published 
a letter on official government paper addressed Correct. to Ademski, who then thought it was but real. But that was and, later, though. That, that was, was later, be, okay. Because otherwise it would have been that they set him up. I mean, that, that mm -hmm. was done by itself. But then, since they, they had it with Adamski, somehow Gray Barker, but this was not revealed until after Barker passed away in eight, 1984. That's when mostly finally published the full story in Saucer Smear, and it's also in his book, you know, with Carl Flock, uh, shockingly close to the truth. So basically, Barker um, somehow had obtained uh, these government documents, stationery, and including envelopes from some relative or friend. And there was, by the way, an FBI investigation about mm -hmm. this eventually, because it's a, you know you're not it, that's illegal to take government to create false right. government documents. But there, nobody oh, was yeah. prosecuted though. So they basically wrote a fake letter from the State Department from an alleged committee at the State Department and signed by this guy R.E. Strait. That's why it's known as a Strait mm -hmm. letter, basically telling Adamski that, yes, at the higher levels of the State Department, we know you're really in contact with extraterrestrials, whatever. And so, of course, Adamski loved it. And then he paraded it in all, the, all his lectures, and he would show the letter and everything. And that's when the, the FBI, I guess, investigation happened. And I do have the files. We ought to post them one of these days. Mm -hmm. And so Hoover sent uh, some agents to discourage Adamski to, to, show the, to, to, you know, to say that he was being endorsed by the government. And Adamski being like, a, I don't know whether he knew Venusians, but he certainly was clever, he then used that to again say, and I had government people come to my house, you know, <laughs> and this used to drive Hoover nuts, according to these documents. You know, so they finally, I guess, threatened him enough that he stopped changing it. But yeah, at that time, nobody knew that it was Barker and Mosley who had, uh, there was a big debate whether they would, their letter, just like there is with an MJ-12 or whatever, mm -hmm. whether the letter with the document was true, whether it was, it was uh, disinformation, whether someone else holds it, and then suddenly in 1984, Mosley confessed. And uh, I think he was involved in a couple of other hoaxes as well. So, but never for money, though. Right. Well, he certainly sounds like a character. I'm sorry I never got the chance to meet him. Uh, he'll certainly be missed. But for anyone who wants to read more about Jim Mosley, you wrote a great article on our website, openminds.tv, so people can go and read that. Right, and we explain a little bit about the straight letter, and mm -hmm. I put, we put a lot of pictures there, too. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. then you'll also write another piece for the uh, February, March issue yeah. of Open Minds magazine. So yeah. that'll be a longer Yeah, and the, piece on and the researcher profile, mm -hmm. uh, which I usually do because I, I knew I met most of these people right. that I write about. Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll do we'll do Jim. So we'll be it will be a kind of a, that will be a more formal bio. Yeah, you know, the, yeah, the one in the web is more more personal. So yeah. speaking of again South America, you just returned from Chile. Mm -hmm. You're going to be headed back to Brazil in a couple of days for another conference. Correct. Yeah. It's been suddenly, you know, these things come in waves, you know, sometimes you don't travel at all, or you, maybe, you, you know, we went to Vegas or something nearby, but then suddenly two trips, right, practically no time in between. Yeah. So, and uh, yes, this is the fourth um, World UFO Forum, which they do in Brazil uh, every so often. It's not every year, mm -hmm. uh, every, every two, three years, whenever they, they, they have, the, the, I guess, the resources. But they have put in the past very large conferences there, uh, John Mack and, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of uh, Stan Friedman, a lot of those uh, famous Americans, as well as people from all over the world, have gone to these conferences. And now they're putting another big one. And, and who's putting this one on? This is uh, A.J. Jalair? Yeah, basically A.J., yeah, with, 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 with uh, you know, his whole UFO organization. Okay. But yeah, basically A.J. is the main promoter there. And it's at a very nice place, Foz de Iguazú, which is in the south of Brazil, near Argentina. And that's where the famous waterfalls, the sort of the Niagara nice tourist Falls. Destination. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. famous tourist destination, so it should be nice for that as well. And they're going to have uh, dozens of speakers, uh, probably as many speakers as we have in, in our Congress. But they'll have a lot of important people from the various South American uh, official commissions mm -hmm. because this is one of the things that, y you know, I've, I've been writing about this a lot in both in our website and in our magazine, that South America is really getting ahead now of, of the world. I yeah, mean, absolutely. In, yeah, in most other countries are just releasing documents. Mm -hmm. That seems to be, and yeah, of course, France, some countries have some, some small units. But uh, South America is create, it's becoming good politics. It's, that's what's interesting, how social perceptions have changed. Whereas in the past, as the, as the Air Force learned here, you know, it was terrible PR in the past to be involved in a UFO 
group, you know, I mean, officially, with just people would make laugh and would laugh at you, your political opponents would ridicule you, so on. But now South America is becoming good politics. And so some of these people will be at this symposium, uh, especially Colonel Sanchez, who is the, um, that was the first UFO group in, created in South America, Uruguay, which is still exists. There were some older investigations in, in the past, but those are long gone. But the Uruguayans, in the same window of the 70s, late 70s, they created an official committee out of the Air Force called Kridovni, and they exist to this day. And so the, the, the colonel that runs it is one of the speakers. Then we'll have Andrea Perez, who is the, um, uh, she's the external member of the Argentinian committee. Mm -hmm. Remember that it was unusual of the Argentinians right, that right. they invited some people from the UFO community as external members, and she deals with the press and that sort of thing, so she'd be the perfect uh, member for that. And um, the, many other ufologists, you know, from, from all over the, especially from all over South America. Uh, Jaime will be there too, Jaime Maussan. And uh, there'll be some people from Europe too. Pinotti, I know, is coming. And, um, well, and we'll be there. So, well, yeah. it should be an exciting event. I can't remember the website off the top of my head, but we'll make sure to post that. And if anybody actually is in the neighborhood of South America next weekend, uh, they can sure check out your talk. Yeah, and we'll be going there with, uh, n not just me, right, with Tom and everything, so we'll, we'll probably be posting something, I'm sure. Right, we'll probably yeah. have some follow-up uh, mm -hmm. pieces on the event. Uh, yeah, it will be great to do interviews, you know, with all these people from South America. So it's, I, I'm certainly looking forward. I think this will be a pretty important, uh, you know, there are events and events, right? Some are mm -hmm. okay, but, but it's unusual when you get that many people, right. and including official people. Yeah, it sounds like a pretty solid event, and mm -hmm. like you said, that, that official representation mm -hmm. there is pretty incredible, so. Yeah, but uh, you know, it's not that uncommon. In South America, the, we've been seeing this phenomenon now for several years, right. where, the, where the civilians put a UFO event, and they invite these colonels or members of these committees, and these people go. Or oh, the guy from the Peruvian, committed to OIFA, he will okay. be there tomorrow, yes. I think that Peruvian committee is kind of uh, in recess right now, mm -hmm. but the same thing happened to the Chilean one, so uh, I don't think it's been totally, uh, you know, discontinuous, just it doesn't have funding right now, so it means that they can revive it at any, at any moment. That's what happened with the Chilean one. The Chilean one was created in the late 90s, it went up to about 2003 or something, and then it, it went on recess, although there was one guy still part-time, you know, getting some correspondence or something. Mm -hmm. And then in 2009, it was created much stronger. And I was recently, as you know, in Santiago, and I, I visited their new facilities and everything. Now they're located next to the Air Force Museum or the Aeronautical Museum. And, uh, we, and they're happy because they're all by themselves there. They said if they could have an office at the at the aeronautical, at the civil aeronautical, except that they, they would be distracted all the time, you know, <laughs> everybody with, oh, what's new with UFOs right, and right. so on. But the, here they have like a totally separate annex. Nobody goes there mm. unless you have to, and uh, it's great. Well, yeah. it'd be nice if the U.S. took a page out of their book, but... Yeah, yeah. and we'll they see, also but. passed in Chile this thing called the Transparency Law, which uh, in which other kind of... Uh, Brazil, I think, has a similar law too, Uruguay too. Uh, where its uh, government is uh, obliged to be transparent, as he right. says. I mean, there are exemptions for national security or whatever, but it's not like in the old days where if, the, if you had a friendly, sometimes you had a friendly guy in head of the committees, you know, even with Blue Book, with Colonel Friend or whatever, and then they would be more forthcoming, but then someone else didn't care for the press, you know, and so, but in South America now they, they have to, otherwise you can sue them. Well, I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited you're going to be at that event, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you everything that happens there. So that's pretty exciting. But Antonio, thank you so much for being on the show today. We're glad we finally got you on. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Anytime, guys. All and right. I can talk about anything anywhere. <laughs> we'll do right anytime. All. Yeah. Yeah. all right. Thanks, Antonio. All right. Bye. Right. That's all for this episode of Spacing Out. Be sure to visit openminds.tv for all the latest news. Thanks for joining us today. We'll be back again next week with another show. I'm Maureen Elsberry. And I'm Jason McClellan. We will see you in the future.